time to look at another exam. And this exam is the third exam of the third class of calculus. Double threes! Woohoo! We're going to be talking about multivariable calculus and in particular integration and get into various things in vector calculus as well. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We have seven problems to look forward to. And of course, as always, if we want the credit, we need to make sure we put our name on the exam because if it's not on the exam, we won't get the points. All right, let's begin. Number one, we're asked to write the following as one equivalent iterated integral by changing the order of integration. You'll see right now we have three integrals written as dy dx. And we're not actually going to integrate. This is all about the setup, because notice we don't even know what the function is. So we start by saying, OK, let's think about what's going on. So we'll go through each of these in turn. So let's start with our first piece here. Now, again, we have our layers. So the outermost layer is saying x goes 0 to negative 2. And the innermost layer says that y goes from 0 to 4 minus x squared. All right. Well, so if we have that information, we can plot. So let's draw a picture. Because this is geometrical. And uh, it's fun to draw pictures. So we're going to draw here. It doesn't have to be a great picture. You can already see I'm a little bit askew here, but that's all right. So we're going from 0 to negative 2. And that's in the x direction. Now in the y direction, we're going from y equals 0 to y equals 4 minus x squared. Now, x squared is our parabola. Minus x squared turns it upside down. The 4 moves it up. So we're coming up here to 4. And we're going to have our parabola turn upside down. So this is y equals 4 minus x squared. All right, so there we go. That's our first integral. Now let's go to our second integral. OK, so what do we have going on here? Again, we match up. So the outside layer is an x layer. So 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 2. The inside is the y layer. 0 less than or equal to y less than or equal to 4. That's actually going to make it really, it's, it's a rectangle, right? It says from 0 up to 2 for x, and from 0 up to 4 for y. All right, great. So that's the middle integral. OK, good. A picture starting to emerge. Our last one. Well, here we go. What do we have? Well, again, pair up. The outer layer is x, inner layer is y. So we're told that x goes between 2 and 3. And that y, well, that goes from 4x minus 8 up to 4. OK, so we're going from 2 to 3. Whoops, 3. There we go. And, well, we're going up to y equals 4. That's up here. Now, 4x minus 8. Well, we don't have to think too hard. We know it's a line, right? And so, since it's a line, I just have to say what's happening at 2, what's happening at 3, and then connect. Plug in 2. 2 times 4 minus 8 is 0. So it's down here. Plug in, in 3, right? 4 times 3 is 12, minus 8 is 4. So it's right there. So it's that line. Ah, that's very convenient. All right, so there's our third piece. And this is y equals 4x minus 8. And uh, all right, great. Now, you'll notice that in each of these integrals, it's a dy dx integral, which means that they were all set up to do our slicing up and down. So if we think about it, if we're going to change, we're going to change the way we slice. So we're not going to do vertical slices. We're going to think of horizontal slices. And now we're like, ah, 
ah, that makes sense. Okay, so let's think about what's going on. So we have integral, integral, f of x, y, and now instead of dy, dx, we're going to do dx, dy. All right, let's start with the outer layer. Well, where does y go from? The bottom is the axis. That's y equals 0. The top is y equals 4. So y goes from 0 to 4, right? Because that's our outer layer. What about x? Well, we're going to go from low value to high value. So what we need to do is say, okay, what's the x over here? And what's the x over there? Currently, we have y as a function of x. So we're going to do our old switcheroo and solve for x as a function of y. All right, well, if we do that, what happens here? Well, uh, on this side, we can say that x squared is 4 minus y. Yes? Yeah, we, we can. Because it's true. And now we say x equals plus or minus square root 4 minus y. Now, which one are we? The plus or the minus? Well, notice that we have negative values. So the two sides are, are, are parabola. One is on the positive x value. One is a negative x value. So we definitely want the negative. Negative square root 4 minus y. So that's our lower bound. What about our upper bound? Well, okay, come over here. And we'll solve for x. So that says 4x is y plus 8, or x is 1 fourth y plus 2, divided by 4. So we go to 1 fourth y plus 2. And we're done. That's it, because all we need to do is set it up. So, woohoo! Nice! Nice! So, this is really testing our geometry, our ability to rewrite. Now, remember that you can pair up. So, these are written in a very specific order. So, you can always think about, okay, what does the outer layer mean? What does the inner layer mean? Draw a picture. We often encourage you to draw pictures, but this test in particular, there's going to be one or two times you really want to draw a picture to get a good idea of geometrically what's going on. All right, good. Nice start. Let's keep it going. Number two. We're asked to evaluate the integral, integral of our region 9x dA, over the region R, which is the right half of the unit circle. Okay, so let's draw our picture. So it's the right half of the unit circle. The unit circle, of course, we, uh, that means the radius is 1. We remember unit is 1. You know, like unit cycle is, is something with one wheel. And uh, unicorn is when there's only one piece of corn. And so, okay, so unit circle. And uh, so let's see what's going on here. Uh, we want the right half. So we're going to choose the right, and so there's our region. Let me shade it in, and uh, all right. Now, what can we do? Well, we could do this just straightforward. I'm going to put that in quotes there. Uh, but I suspect it says, hey, you know, circles, what works well for circles? Polar. So let's do this as polar. All right, sure, why not? So let's think about this region in terms of polar. Well, what can we say? Our theta tells us about how we've gone around the circle. So we can say, all right, that says negative pi halves is less than or equal to theta is less than or equal to pi halves. So negative pi halves is down here, swing around to pi halves, which is up there. Now, what about r? Well, r. You go from the origin out to where you hit the curve. Now, in this case, the curve is a circle of radius 1, so 0 less than or equal to r, less than or equal to 1. So, we now have our integral. Uh,
bound set up. Say, okay, so if we're integrating over our region of 9x dA, we can do it by saying that's the integral, integral. Now, 9, and then we'll come back and talk about x in a second. And dA in polar is r dr d theta. Okay, so just making some notes here. So this is our dA. Good. And when it comes to bounds, just remember you, you work through. So the theta is the outer bounds. So that would be negative pi halves to positive pi halves. All right. And then the r, that's our inner bounds. Okay. So that would be 0 to 1. Now, are we done? No. We have one thing we haven't accounted for, which is our x, because it's the integral of 9x. All right. Well, how do we handle the x? Well, we have that x is r cosine theta. And in a similar way, we could say y equals r sine theta. We don't need it, but we know it. So this becomes r cosine theta. All right, good. Well, now that we have that, we're ready to go. And uh, what can we do? Well, we can do it one layer at a time. We can actually do both layers independently because notice that here, these are all numbers. And so the one layer will probably not depend on the next. But that's all right. Let's just do it one layer at a time. We can enjoy the problem. We should enjoy it. You know, taking a test shouldn't always feel like a, a bad experience. Sometimes you can enjoy it. Hopefully more than sometimes. All right, so we're integrating first with respect to r. That means treat the theta as a constant. So cosine theta, for right now, we're treating it like a constant. r squared. The integral of r squared, one-third r cubed. Well, we have a 9, 1 third times 9, leaves us with 3 r cubed, and the cosine theta came along as a constant, and now we're going from r equals 0 to r equals 1. I like to add this just because when we're doing multivariable integrals, it's important to remember what thing we're evaluating. So plug in 0, you get 0. Plug in 1, you get 1. Uh, and so we end up, after our evaluation, with 3 cosine theta. Well, that's not a bad integral. The integral of cosine? Sine. And positive sine, right? Yeah, the, the integrals involving sine and cosine can be a little bit tricky, but uh, when we're patient, we can get it right. No need to rush. Take our time. Get the points. Okay, so we plug in. So we get 3 sine of pi over 2, subtract 3 sine negative pi over 2, and sine of pi over 2 is 1. It's the y value. Sine of negative pi over 2 is negative 1. Again, the y value. And so this becomes, uh, move this up a little bit here, 3 minus 3 times minus 1, or 3 plus 3, which is 6. And there we go. That's our answer. All right. Wonderful. Off to a rousing start. Number three. Find the volume of the solid described in cylindrical coordinates by saying that z goes between 0 and r. r is at most cosine 2 theta. And minus pi over 4 less than or equal to theta less than or equal to pi over 4. All right. Now, there's a clue here that we should use cylindrical coordinates. And the clue is they tell us. That's a very strong clue. And we often pick up on those ones. Now, even if they hadn't told us, as soon as we see something like this, we're like, oh, OK. So z and r together, that's cylindrical. Now, what's going on? We can get sort of a rough idea of the shape. And, and I'll just sort of reason through it a little bit. So let's think about what's happening downstairs. So in the plane. 
So in the plane, we can talk about our theta goes from negative pi over 4, that's down here, to positive pi over 4, that's up here. And then we have this curve cosine 2 theta. Now, what is that? Well, let's just think about a few points. At negative pi over 4, if you plug that in, that's cosine minus pi halves, 0. At positive pi over 4, cosine pi halves, 0. Plug in 0, cosine 0, 1. So it starts, it goes out, it comes in. All right, so it's, it's a leaf of some sort. Okay, so that's our region downstairs. Now what's happening upstairs? Well, what's happening upstairs is that we're going from zero up to R. So the further out we go, the higher up we go. So there's this solid coming up that goes uphill as we go further out. Now it's not a flat plane because, you know, it depends on R. So, but, but essentially the idea is the further you go, the higher up you are. Okay, so that's our shape. Well, what do we do? Okay, well, how do you find volume? Now volume, actually there's a nice formula for it. It's called integrate one, right? So if I want to find a volume of a solid, we integrate over our region one dV. All right, well, we're going to do it in our cylindrical. dV has an r, dz, dr, d theta. And now we say, well, can we figure out what's going on? Well, uh, okay, we can work through. Now, notice these all have 0 to something, 0 to r here, negative power 4 to power 4. This one says r less than equal to cosine 2 theta it's really 0 less than or equal to r, less than or equal to cosine 2 theta. All right, so that's good to keep in mind because we're going to have this region, so we're going out, downstairs. So I say, oh, okay, so it's brilliantly set up for us. Now, we have to think about our bounds. Let's talk about, can we just go in this order? Sometimes we have to switch it up. Uh, okay, so theta goes negative pi over 4 to pi over 4. All right, that's not too bad. r goes 0 to cosine 2 theta. Okay, that's not too bad. And then z goes 0 to r. Great. All right, well, that's not bad at all. And really, it's, it's pretty quick to get this one set up. Now we just work through one layer at a time. These are onion problems. There's layers. And uh, hopefully no tears involved. Or if there are tears, there are tears of joy. All right, negative pi over 4 to positive pi over 4. 0, cosine 2 theta. We're integrating with respect to z. r is acting like a constant. So we have r times z. And we're going from z equals 0 to z equals r. And then we have our dr d theta. Well, okay, plug in 0, you get 0. Plug in, uh, whoops, that should be a z. Plug in r, you get r. r times r, r squared. All right, so that's integral. Negative pi over 4 to pi over 4 of the integral. 0 cosine 2 theta r squared. Ah, interesting. All right, now, what's the integral of r squared? It is one-third r cubed. Yes? Yeah, it is. Because we're integrating r squared with respect to r. So, negative pi over 4 to positive pi over 4. And we have one-third r cubed. Evaluate r equals 0. r equals cosine 2 theta d theta. All right. Hmm. Let's give ourselves some space here. And uh, we can evaluate. So negative pi over 4, positive pi over 4. Plug in 0, we get 0. Ah, 0, you're the best. Uh, plug in 
cosine 2 theta, and we get 1 third cosine cubed of 2 theta. And that's, hmm, hmm, hmm. Can we integrate cosine cubed? Well, we can if we're careful. Okay, so how do you integrate cosine cubed? It turns out we're kind of in a good place. It's an odd power. So we're not going to have to pull out any weird identities. Uh, how are we going to think about cosine cubed? Well, we can think of cosine cubed as cosine squared times cosine. So that when you have an odd power of cosine, you, you, you pull off a single cosine. Now, how does that help us? Well, let's, what's another way to think of cosine squared? 1 minus sine squared. Aha! Uh -huh. Okay, so how does that help us? Well, notice the derivative of sine is cosine. So, here's what's going to happen. We're going to make a substitution. All right, so we're going to let u equal sine of 2 theta, and then du would be 2 cosine 2 theta d theta. This 2 coming from the chain rule. All right, now you might say, well, I don't have a 2. How do we fix that? Well, we use our advanced technology called divide by 2. So a half du is cosine 2 theta d theta. All right, so let's update everything. All right, what do we have? This is equal to integral 1 third. Now, the cosine cubed became 1 minus sine squared 2 theta cosine 2 theta. 1 minus sine squared, well, that became 1 minus u squared. Cosine 2 theta became 1 half du. Or really, we should say cosine 2 theta d theta became 1 half du. And don't forget the bounds. Okay, so negative pi over 4. Plug in negative pi over 4. 2 times negative pi over 4, that's negative pi over 2. Sine of negative pi over 2, negative 1. Plug in pi over 4. Sine of pi over 2, positive 1. All right, good. Progress. Wonderful, beautiful progress. Okay, well, uh, now... Since we're running out of paper, we'll start working our way back up. And uh, what does this equal? Well, we can do the integral. So 1 third times 1 half is 1 6. Then we're going to get u minus 1 third u cubed. And we're going to evaluate from u equals minus 1 to u equals plus 1. Well, when we plug in, we'll have 1 6 times, plug in 1, 1 minus a third, that's 2 thirds. Subtract, plug in minus 1, you're going to get minus 1 minus a third times minus 1, which is minus 2 thirds. Well, okay, 2 thirds minus minus 2 thirds, that really becomes a plus. So we have 1 six times 4 thirds, and then we say, oh, well, we can cancel a 2. So we have 1 third times 2 thirds, also known as 2 ninths. And done. Whew. All right, good. Good, we got an answer, and it worked out pretty well. So that's lovely, lovely. Well, let's keep going. Number four, let R be the parallelogram with the vertices 1, 2, 4, 5, 5, 9, 2, 6. And, uh, okay, so that's our, our parallelogram. Now, of course, we really want to think of this as the region bounded by the parallel, parallelogram, but that's okay. All right, so here's our, our region. And we're asked to compute the integral over our region of this expression, y minus x e to the 4x minus y dA. By first carrying out the change of variables, u equals 4x minus y 
and v equals y minus x. All right, good, good. So let's think about what we need to do. Now, there's three things that have to be done. We have to talk about uh, our function. We have to talk about our bounds. And we have to talk about our dA. All right, so currently, what do we have? Well, currently, our dA, we should have it as our dx dy or dy dx because it's written in, phrase, in terms of y and x. And we're going to switch over to u and v. All right, so anyways, we have those three things. Let's talk about them. I like to start with uh, the Jacobian, which really handles the dA. So here we go. What can we say? Well, we're going to find the Jacobian of xy, which is a determinant. And then we fill in our little pieces, ux, uy, vx, vy. Now, our Jacobian is super duper generous. You know, if you, if you get it, the transpose off, or if, if you swap the rows, or even if you swap the columns, it's going to be fine. Now, I should say it's not just the determinant, it's the absolute value of the determinant. All right, so what is this going to be? Well, uh, take the derivatives here. So the absolute value of u with respect to x is 4, u with respect to y, minus 1, v with respect to x, minus 1, v with respect to y is plus 1. All right. So that would be absolute value of 4 minus 1, which is 3. What is that telling us? Well, it's telling us the following. It tells us that du dv is 3 dx dy. So, and that 3 here is what goes there. All right, so it's the thing that happens with substitution because this is a substitution problem. It's just a multivariable substitution problem. Now you might say, but oh, there is no, no three. No problems. We can do this. So in particular, we can say one third, I'm gonna use the same color just to keep things consistent, one third du dv is our dx dy, which is what we call dA. All right, so that handles this piece. Now we have to talk about the other two items, function and bounds. Now that we've handled uh, our dA, we see it's just going to be a constant, so we don't have to grab anything here. Sometimes you do, so that's why you have to be careful. So now we say, okay, what about the function? Well, we say, all right, y minus x e to the 4x minus y. And we say we want to rewrite this expression in terms of u and v. Well, we see a y minus x. We say, oh, well, that's v. We see a 4x minus y. We say, oh, that's u. And uh, done, right? That's how quick it usually goes. So the function is pretty fast. And the Jacobian is actually pretty fast too. It's just a matter of you got to keep track of where everything goes. All right, now the bounds. Ooh, okay, so we have to be careful here. Now let's think about the, these bounds. They're probably going to look a lot like these things. So you're going to kind of clue off of them, but be careful and do the work. So let's see what we have. Well, here, let's start on this side. Now that looks like a line because it's a line. Well, can you say anything about that line? It has a slope of one. Brilliant, slope of one. Can you say anything more about that line? Well, yeah, you can imagine that you were to extend it and you can see that it intersects the y-axis at 1. So I say, okay, so we know 
slope of 1, y-intercept of 1, y equals x plus 1. Now, up here, we also have a slope of 1. See, you can even discount. One, one over, one up, one over, one up. And so where do we intersect the axis? Well, at uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. So you say, great, this is y equals x plus 4. Great, wonderful. OK, now, be a little bit more careful here. Uh, hmm, how about this one? Well, what's the slope? We go over 1, up 1. Slope of 4. Cool. Okay, so that says y equals 4x. Now, we're probably going to have a hard time seeing the intercept, but we don't have to, right? Because we say, well, I know a point on the line. 1, 2. So when we plug in x equals 1, y should be 2. So I need 2 equals 4 something. Well, that should be 2 equals 4 minus 2. Do you see how we did that? Again, we said we know a point, 1, 2. So we plug that in. 2 for y, 1 for x. We said, OK, 2 equals 4. And then what makes it true? Four, 2 equals 4 minus 2 makes it true. We'll do it again. Come over here. And again, we go over 1, up 1, 2, 3, 4. So slope is 4. So y equals 4x. And then there's something here. What's the something? Well, we have a point. Now, we actually have a couple of points. So I'm going to note that this point here, I'll use a different color, that this point is uh, at uh, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is 4, 5. Now, plug in. So we need 5 equals... 4 times 4, which is 16. 5 equals 16 what? Makes that true. So what do we need to add here? So 5 equals 16 minus 11. Yes? You can check. 5 does equal 16 minus 11. You can even come all the way up to this really high point, which is 5 comma 9. Does 9 equal 20 minus 11? Yeah, it does. All right, good. So we have four bounding curves. And what we want to do is now rewrite those bounding curves in terms of u and v. So let's write these curves down. Uh, we have y equals x plus 1, and y equals x plus 4, and y equals 4x minus 2, and y equals 4x minus 11. So put on your idea of like looking for u's and v's. You say, oh, to get a y minus x, I can subtract y minus x equals 1. Here, y minus x equals 4. And then, oh, that says v equals 1. v equals 4. 4x minus y? Well, swap the y's and the constants. So this becomes 4x minus y equals 2. This becomes 4x minus y equals 11. All right, well, that says 4x minus y. That's u equals 2, and u equals 11. And so our region, in, and when we talk about our region, in the uv plane is now really simple. We're going to have 2 less than or equal to u less than or equal to 11, and 1 less than or equal to v less than or equal to 4. All right. So we've got our ways to split up. We've got our function. We've got our region. We put it all together. And now we say, aha, this integral is the following. Namely, we're going to do our integral, integral, and we'll have v e to the u, and we kind of have a choice here. Do we want du dv or dv du? In this case, it doesn't really matter, because 
we're over a rectangle and the functions are so nice, we can even separate things out. So let's just go with what we wrote down, du, dv. Sometimes a choice matters. Sometimes it doesn't. And don't forget the one third because, of course, we don't want to lose any points. All right, so one third, uh, v, e, the u, d, u, d, v, get the bounds. v goes one, four, u goes two, eleven. All right, well, uh, we still have to compute, right? It's not set up, it's compute. So, you know, make sure you read the instructions. If it was set up, stop. If it's compute, keep going. And uh, well, we read instructions because we want to get all the points. I know. Shh. Don't tell anybody we're after all the points. All right. Well, hmm. we can go ahead and just do it one layer at a time. Or if you like pulling things apart, that's cool too. The integral of e to the u is e to the u. And we're doing the integral of e to the u because we're doing du. And evaluate u equals 2, du equals 11, dv. So this becomes 1 third, integral 1 to 4 of v. And then we have e to the 11 minus e squared. Now, this is a constant. So it's a big constant. And uh, without a calculator, we can't say much more. But that's all right. It's still a constant. So that can even come out. 1 third e to the 11 minus e squared, then the integral 1 to 4 v dv. Well, that's 1 third e to the 11 minus e squared, and that's integral v is 1 half v squared. Evaluate that 1 to 4. And, uh, well, I didn't write v equals, but because there's only one variable, we know what that is. All right, so uh, that's 1 6 e to the 11th minus e squared. So the 1 6 is 1 third times a half. And then we have v squared, which is 16, because we plug in 4, 4 squared, minus 1 squared. And 16 minus 1, this is 15. And now we say, OK, great. So this is 15. And 15 and 6 have a common factor. They have a common factor of 3. So it's like, okay, so we'll, we'll pull out that common factor. So we're left with the following, namely 5 over 2 e to the 11 minus e squared. And done. Whoo! Wow! What a workout. Good, good. But the procedure is not so bad, right? Think of the procedure. Every integral has three parts. How do you break things up? What's the function? What's the region? So the break things up is the sort of the subtle part. And so I just say, look, take u and v as given and take the partial derivatives. That gives you Jacobian at xy. And then you can say your du dv is your Jacobian xy dx dy. And then you just have to say, how do I account for that? In this case, you divide by a third. Rewrite your function in terms of v and u. Now, sometimes this part right here, you'll absorb a piece. Sometimes you won't. So that's why it's good to do, good to do the Jacobian first. For the region, figure out your bounding curves. Write them all down, and then rewrite them in terms of u and v. And then, once you have your pieces, you put it all together, you carry it out, life is good. Ah, oh, I like these problems. It can be a lot of fun. Number five. Let C be the straight line from 0, 1, 2 to 2, 7, 6. And find the integral on this straight line, x, y, d, s. Ooh, okay, all right. Well, so we're doing a line integral. And so how do we do a line integral? Well, uh, we can just carry it out. So we're going to be doing some parameterization here. All right, so we have to think about what's going on. So we're in our three-dimensional space, and I'm not going to try to be super specific here. I'm just going to say, what do we have? 
we have our point 0, 1, 2, and we have our other point 2, 7, 6. I, again, I'm not claiming at all that this is the right points, but we're moving along the curve. Now, uh, what do we do? Well, we just need to, to pick a parameterization. Okay, so how do we pick one? Well, we come along here and say it's a line, so we can think about how do you describe lines. And we have this wonderful way to do parameterizations of lines, namely, you start with your point, and I'm starting because it says from this point to that point. So we're starting at 0, 1, 2. Then you say, what's this vector here? Well, what's the difference? You say, I moved up 2 in the x direction, 6 in the y direction, and 4 in the z direction. So if you take 0, 1, 2, and you know, entry by entry added 2, 6, 4 respectively, you get 276. So that 264 is what's going to go into the coefficients in front of the t's. So we have our point and we have our direction vector. And there we have our, our parameterization. All right, great, cool. Now, what do we do? Well, we're going to turn everything in terms of our line here. Now, let's be a little bit careful here. With this parameterization, at time 0, we're at our point. At time 1, we're at our other point. So at time 0, we're at our initial point. And at time 1, we're at our terminal point. So we're going to have 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 1. So our goal in doing this is we're going to turn our line integral into an integral in terms of t. So t is a time, and that's the parameterization. So what needs to happen? Well, we say the following, the integral along the curve of x, y, ds is the integral. Now we use the time, 0 to 1. We have to replace x and y. Well, we have x is 2t, and y is 1 plus 6t, and then we have our ds. Now, we're not quite ready yet, but I'm going to go ahead and pause here just so we make sure we're all on the same page. So, to do a line integral, we can parameterize, and uh, so that's what's going on. We've got our x, and then we've got our y, all right? and we have our bounds. And so now the big question, what is ds? Okay, so ds, this is a little bit of arc length. That's how I think of it. And so I say, oh, okay, so if that's a little bit of arc length, there's a nice way to write that. It says that ds equals the square root of x prime squared plus y prime squared plus z prime squared dt. All right, so that's our little bit of arc length. Okay, all right, well, uh, what do we have? We have, this is going to be the square root of, we'll have 2 squared plus y prime is 6 squared, and uh, z prime is 4 squared dt. Well, that's the square root of 4 plus 36 plus 16. All right, great. Well, 4 plus 36 is 40, and then 40 plus 16 is 56. The square root of 56 dt. Well, can we clean that up? Uh, 56 is 4 times 14. So we can say this is 2 square root 14 dt. All right. Good. Good. Now, what do we do? Well, we, we replace 
our ds in terms of dt. So we now have the following, namely this integral is the integral 0 to 1, and uh, we have already our 2t times 1 plus 6t, which by the way is 2t plus 12t squared, and then the ds is 2 square root of 14 dt. Now we can pull out uh, all sorts of things really, but we're going to pull out the 2 square root of 14 to the front. So 2 square root of 14. Now what's the integral? Integral of 2t, t squared. Integral of 12t squared. Well, okay, that would be t cubed divided by 3, 4 t cubed. I'm going to evaluate t equals 0, t equals 1. Now the nice thing about 0 with polynomials is it's really easy to evaluate. It's also the nice thing about 1 in polynomials, really easy to evaluate. Add the coefficients. So plug in 0 you get 0, plug in 1 you get 5. And so we're left with 5 times 2 times root 14, also known as 10 times the square root of 14. And that's it. We're done. We made it. Wow. See, it's not so bad. It's just a matter of, of saying, okay, how can we rewrite all of this in terms of a parameterization? Because the thing is, we don't really have a good idea of how to do it when we're moving along a curve, but we're able to handle in terms of a single parameter t. So we were saying, okay, turn everything into that parameter t, get your bounds, rewrite your function in terms of your t, that comes from the parameterization, and remember that ds stands for arc length. We know how to do arc length. So that tells us what we should have. Put it all together, work it out, and we're just like doing great. We're proud of ourselves. We're making great progress. We're going to do wonderful. Number six, a two-parter too. We have a vector field f, which is given here. Part a, show that f is conservative by finding a potential function. And what does it mean, a potential function? Well, it means we're looking for little f. Now, notice here how it's not bold. That means it's just a function of x, y, and z, the kind that we're used to. So it's not a vector function. It's an old-fashioned function. And we want that when you take the gradient of that, we get capital F. So another way to say that is that what we have going on is that this first part right here, that is really f, little f, x. The second part is little f, y. And the third part is little f, z. So we have our partial derivatives of f. And we say, OK, can we somehow put all of our partial derivatives together and find one function, one function to rule them all, if you will. Well, we can make lots of progress, right? So we say, OK, what can we say? I have the partial derivative with respect to x. So we say, ah, well, you know, f will be the integral of f sub x dx, right? Because if you take a derivative and then you integrate again, you get back to where you started. Almost. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So we're going to integrate our 2x minus 3y with respect to x, which would be x squared, because x is our variable. 3y, well, with respect to x, that's a constant. So that would become minus 3xy. Now, we said almost. Where's the almost come into play? Well, it comes into play in the fact that we're off by a constant. Now, you have to think about what that means. It's not just a constant. It's a constant with respect to x. So there's some other pieces here. So constant, which only depends on y and z. So it's a constant function. So our goal is to say, what's that constant function? All right. Great. Well, what is it? Mm. Let's think about this. 
Well, let's take the derivative with respect to y. What do we have now? Well, we have f sub y. We know what it is from up here. It's 2z e to the 2yz minus 3x. All right, so we'll just copy. But we can also come here. Well, this is f. Take the derivative with respect to y. That goes away. There's no y. The next term is minus 3x, because we're taking the derivative with respect to y. And then plus cy. y is the partial derivative of the function c with respect to y. Now, what does that tell us? That tells us that, hey, we can say that c sub y, partial derivative with respect to y, is those terms cancel, and we end up with our 2z e to the 2y. All right, well, that's cool. So what do we do? Well, if we want to get C, we need to figure out what's, what's the integral, right? So we can say, ah, all right. So C of Y, Z is the integral of C sub Y dy, right? Same mindset, which is, the integral of 2z e to the 2yz dy. Now, 2z is a constant. Whew! Oh, good. No integration by parts here. And if we take our, our derivative, or sorry, our integral with respect to y, well, we would have the constant 2z e to the 2yz, but then we'd have to divide by 2z. So that's e to the 2yz, because the 2z's will cancel. Plus, anything constant with respect to y, which means a function of z. All right, well, what have we done? We've now gone a little bit closer. So we can now update and say, hey, updating, we have that f, looks like x squared minus 3xy, and now our constant is e to the 2yz plus something that depends on z. So we're really close, but this we don't quite know yet. All right, so what comes next? Well, we have to find out z. So we're going to do something similar to what we just did, namely we'll take fz. So taking the derivative, that goes away, that goes away. We're going to get our 2y e to the 2y z. That's the derivative of this expression with respect to z. And plus d prime of z. That equals, according to this, 2y e to the 2y z. And now we say, well, those cancel. So that tells us that d prime of z is equal to zero. Well, what function has the derivative of zero? We say, oh, well, that tells us that our function d of z is really some constant e. All right, so we now have, after putting this all together, we come to our conclusion that f will look like x squared minus 3xy plus e to the 2yz plus some constant e. Now, this is actually every f. It just says find a potential function. So you, you could just say stop there. But uh, there we go. There's our, our potential function. All right, good. We found it. And uh, we can set e equals 0. All right, good. Part b. Now, by the way, in part a, there are other ways to do this process. This one is sort of like climbing a ladder. It says, all right, well, start using the first term, and you get f almost. You say, okay, but there's this little constant. Okay, use the next term to refine what that constant is, and use the third term to nail it down. Uh, there are other ways. 
this is not testing you on using what we just did. If you have a valid method, great, use it. And if you're not sure, if you're like, oh, I'm worried they're not going to give me points, here's something that you can always justify, which is to say, this, I think, is the answer. And how do I know it's the answer? I can just start here and take the gradient. So if you, if you say, this is where I think the answer is, and now take the gradient and you get this capital F, then you've justified it. You'll get the points. At least you have a really good argument. So in my opinion, you'll, you'll get the points. So if, if, if you're in doubt whether or not you'll get full points, take the gradient at the end and show that, hey, it works. Part B. Now we're going to evaluate an integral along a curve of f dot t ds. Oh, this is the good one. This is a good one. Now f dot t ds actually has a lot of forms, uh, but this is starting to get into calculus -y type stuff. And it looks scary, right? But the fact that you had a part A showing that it's conservative should try to start ringing some bells. And uh, so what's going to happen here? Well, what's going to happen is when you're conservative, and sometimes this integral is written integral along c of f dot t ds, sometimes it's written as integral along c f dot dr, but the, the moral here is if f conservative, then this is little f, and you take your endpoint evaluated and you subtract your start point. In other words, it's like the fundamental theorem of calculus because it is the fundamental theorem of calculus. And it says, hey, the punchline is I only need to know this function little f, the potential function, at the end, subtract the potential function at the start. We already know that we're conservative. So we know we can use this formula. So what do we need to do? We need to know where we start. We need to know where we end. Now, you'll notice, what do we have? Well, our curve, R1, starts, and let's just get a rough sketch, at time zero. So, uh, oh, so it's three-dimensional. That's cool. So we start at a point at namely plug in zero, we're at negative two, zero, three. And then at time one, well, we've moved to negative one, five, five. Okay, so we're starting here. This is our t equals zero, t equals one, and zoop, we move along the curve. All right, now at t equals one, where are we? Well, we hopefully should be here. So let's just make sure we are. Negative one, five, 11 minus six is five, and 10 minus five is five, good. Now if it hadn't, either they made a mistake or you'd say treat them separately. Okay, so, all right, whoops, I forgot to mark, all right. So where are we at time two? Well, at time two, Plug in two. So eight minus five is three. Negative 12 plus 11 is negative one. Negative 10 plus 10 is zero. And so we now move over here at time t equals two. So we have these two pieces. Now the, the punchline here, it's all one curve. You might say, but wait, it's kind of like, there's a kink here. Do we have to worry? No. As long as it's a continuous curve, we're good to go. You really can think of it as, you can say, look, take this point, subtract that point, and this point, subtract that point, and the punchline is the point in the middle cancels. So it's okay that there's this, this sort of sharp potential bend. All right, well now, we know our start point, that's our time equals zero. We know our end point, that's time t equals two. 
And so we are ready to go. I'm ever so nervous here, so I'm just going to quickly double check because, you know, this is a, a place where it's easy to make a mistake. And, uh, and you know, you don't want to get to the end and be like, ah, oh, I, I just made a small algebra mistake and I lose a point. No, no, we don't want that. So, okay, so here we go. We're almost there. So we're going to have, this is equal to our function at our end, 3 minus 1, 0. Subtract our function at our start. So that's at negative 2, 0, 3. All right, so here we go. This is our function. And remember, we can set our constant to be whatever we want. So we're going to treat our constant like 0. So we're going to have x squared, 9, minus 3 times x times y. Well, that's going to be 3 times 3 times minus 1. And we're subtracting that. So that makes it a plus 9. Then we're going to have e to the 2 times minus 1 times 0. That's e to the 0. That's 1. So 9 plus 9 plus 1. Subtract. All right, here we go. Negative 2 squared, 4. Minus 3 times minus 2 times 0 is 0. And, uh, well, don't forget, we're subtracting, right? Oh, no, it doesn't matter. Okay, but we'll put 0. All right, and then e to the 2 times 0 times 3. That's e to the 0 again. All right, so that's plus 1. And now, what do we end up with? Well, here we have 19, subtract 5, leaving us with 14. And there we go. Good. So part B really uses part A and making sure do you understand that there's this sort of fundamental theorem of calculus thing going on. And it's the fundamental theorem of calculus for line integrals, which is to say that something is conservative if it essentially has an antiderivative. That's what we were after. All right, good. Whew, what a problem. I hope you had fun. But don't worry, we still have one more, so there's more fun to be had. Our last problem. Number seven. The vector field f is defined as, and we have f is 2x cosine pi y i plus 3xy and we're asked to find the outward flux of f across the curve c, the integral along the curve c, f dot n ds, where c travels counterclockwise along the boundary of the triangle with vertices 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 2. All right, let's get a picture about what's going on with our, our curve c. So we're in the plane. We can see that we're in the plane because we have two-dimensional coordinates. We also see that our vector field is x and y. So we'll start by sketching, make it a little bit sketchy here, and we mark our points. Well, we have the origin, that's 0, 0. Then we have our point 2, 0, so that's x equals 2, y equals 0. And we have our point 0, 2, so that's x equals 0, y equals 2. And we're traveling counterclockwise. That's actually important here. Okay. So, counterclockwise means in that direction. So here's our curve C. And we're around the whole triangle. Now, the reason we know we're on the whole triangle, you see that little tiny circle there? That means it's a closed loop. So it's an integral of a closed loop. All right. Cool. Now, how do we do this? We could do each integral individually. Oh, let's see if we can avoid that. And we start saying, well, is there anything we've learned? And in particular, we think about it's the last problem. It's probably something we learned really recently. And there is something we've learned. It's called Green's Theorem. All right, so what does Green's Theorem say? Well, Green's theorem, there's actually two variations of it. So we'll write them down here. And, uh, well, 
The first variation that we often learn about is to say the integral around a curve oriented counterclockwise, it has to be counterclockwise, of our f dot t ds is equal to the integral over our region of our n sub uh, x minus m sub y dA. They might say, what region? Well, the curve bounds a region. And so in terms of the picture, we have a triangle. That's being bound here, so I'll highlight the triangle. And now we say, okay, our region is the triangle. So here's our R. All right, now I said there were two, and this is one of them, and it doesn't match, right? Because there's a dot T versus a dot N. What's the dot N variation? The dot N variation says F dot N DS is the integral over our region of, and now it's M sub X plus N sub Y. All right, so we're in our second case. And so we're going to go from, instead of integrating along a curve, to integrating in a region. Now you might say, doesn't that make things more difficult? Sometimes, but sometimes what happens is because we're taking these partial derivatives, it all has a way of sort of working itself out. And so let's go ahead and give it a chance. And if it doesn't work, we can always come back and try something else. Uh, but I suspect that they gave it to us, it will work. So here we go. So we're integrating along our curve f dot n ds. That's the integral over our region. Let's first clean it up. m sub x. Now, in terms of what is m and n, it's m i and j. So this first part is our m. So when we take the derivative of that with respect to x, we're going to end up with 2 cosine of pi y. Then n sub y, that's the derivative of 3xy with respect to y, which is 3x. All right, good. Now the next thing is we have to decide how are we breaking this up. Are we going to do dy dx? Are we going to do dx dy? Uh, does it matter? And, uh, well, let's do dy dx. Why not? Okay, so dy dx means we're thinking about doing our, our cutting up. And let me grab a good color here. So dy dx thinks we're slicing this way. You can do it either way. And if one seems hard, try the other. All right, so this will be integral. Integral, give our some space for bounds. 2 cosine pi y plus 3x and dy dx. All right, so let's start. Where does x go from? Well, x goes 0 to 2. All right, our smallest, smallest value of x is at 0, largest value is at 2. 0, 2. What about y? Well, y goes from the bottom, y equals 0, to the top. Okay, so we have to think about this curve. What is this curve? Well, it has a slope of negative 1, down 2 over 2, and a y-intercept of 2, so that says y equals minus x plus 2. So we're going 0 to minus x plus 2. All right, well, now we just work. And let's see what comes out. Okay, so we'll have, this will be integral 0 to 2. When we integrate with respect to y, well, the integral of this term, there's a y on the inside, the integral of cosine is sine, but we need to divide by the pi to account for the pi on the inside. So we'll have 2 over pi sine of y. Now here, the integral of 3x with respect to y is 3xy. And we're going to evaluate. Whoops, I forgot to put my pi in here. It's pi y. Ah, ah, it's getting very 
Okay, pi y, there we go. It's easy to make a copy error. Classic mistake. Take your time, double check. And we're evaluating from y equals 0 to y equals minus x plus 2. And uh, dx. Okay, well, plug in 0. Sine of 0 is 0. That's nice. 3 times x times 0 is 0. Wow, that's beautiful. So what's left? Well, plug in negative x plus 2. So you have 2 over pi. And then you have pi, whoops, sine of pi, negative x plus 2. All right. And then we have plus 3x times negative x plus 2. And all of that dx. Okay. Well, hmm, keep going. All right. Well, uh, can we clean this up? We can do a little bit here. Notice we can distribute. So this is the same as sine of minus pi x plus 2 pi. And if we wanted to, we can do a couple things. Sine is a 2 pi periodic function. So this is the same as sine of minus pi x. And sine is also a rather peculiar or strange or weird function. So you can bring out a minus sign. So sine of pi x. So this is equal to integral 0 to 2. So we have minus 2 over pi, sine of pi x, and then here, minus 3x squared plus 6x, because we can distribute through. All right, well, again, what's the integral of sine? Negative cosine. Well, that gets rid of the negative, divide by pi again, so we're going to have 2 over pi squared cosine of 2 pi x. Now, integral of minus 3x squared minus x cubed. Integral of 6x will be 3x squared. Evaluate from x equals 0 to x equals 2. All right, so when we plug in, when you plug in 2, cosine of 4 pi is 1. So we're going to get 2 over pi squared. Negative times 2 cubed, that's minus 8. Uh, 2 squared times 3, that's plus 12. All right, so that's plug in 2, subtract, plug in 0. Cosine 0 is 1. So you have a 2 over pi squared. 0 cubed is 0. 3 times 0 squared is 0. And then we're like, oh, the 2 over pi squared is cancel. Negative 8 plus 12 is 4. Whew! All that for a 4. Well, it's a nice answer, and we like nice answers. So there we go. A fun problem. Fun problem. And the key, no green steering. It's a fundamental theorem of calculus in a two-dimensional setting. Oh, I hope you had a lot of fun. I hope you're ready. I know we took our time, and you're probably like, ah! Am I going to have enough time? You'll be fine. If you prepare, if you practice, you'll find that the problems have a natural flow and you start to recognize things. And uh, you'll, you'll do wonderful. I believe in you. And maybe I'll get to see you again, right? All right. Take care. Bye.